Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Supporting School and Teacher Leaders to Rebuild Community Through Harmony. Today you will hear the latest research about keys to rebuilding school communities as students and staff head back to school after a disruptive school year. Harmony and Inspire Teaching and Learning are hosting this webinar to support educators and school leaders as they rebuild their communities with an SEL focus. Now for a few reminders about this webinar. For best viewing live, it's recommended that you shut down your other browsers. Throughout today's discussion, we hope to make this, conver this a conversation among panelists and all of you. Please use the question box on your GoToWebinar panel to submit questions, comments, or ponderings. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording within the next week. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive a copy of the certificate of completion from GoToWebinar within 48 hours. You can also download a copy of the slide deck today under the handout tab on our GoToWebinar, on our GoToWebinar panel. Now let me give you a brief overview of this webinar today. We have many exciting topics to cover. In just a moment, we will be hearing the latest research about the best practices to rebuild school communities. Then we will be sharing highlights from our recently released back to school toolkits with Harmony and Inspire resources aligned to support rebuilding communities. Then we will highlight several partner districts who are rebuilding their communities in amazing ways. And at the end of this webinar, stay tuned. We are so excited to provide you with a sneak peek of Harmony third edition to be released mid fall. But before we get started, we wanted to take a brief poll just to see who is in our audience today. Let's go ahead and launch the poll. Please let us know if you're an educator, administrator, after school provider, nonprofit leader, or other. And if you are other, you can answer in the question box what your role is. We will give you a minute to respond. Okay, our responses are coming in. A few more seconds. All right, let's see who is in our audience today. Great, the majority of our audience are educators, followed by after school providers and administrators. And we have some nonprofit leaders as well, and some other in the audience, social workers education students, site coordinators, we're hearing in the question box. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled that you made the time to be here. Now, without further ado, let's get started. And I'd like to introduce our featured speaker. Dr. Doug Fisher is professor and chair of educational leadership at San Diego State University and a leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College, having been an early intervention teacher and elementary school educator. He has published numerous articles on reading and literacy, differentiated instruction, and curriculum design, as well as books such as the Distance Learning Playbook, PLC Plus, Better Decisions and Greater Impact by Design, Building Equity, and Assessment Capable Learners. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fisher. Thank you. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for engaging with us on these important topics and things that we're thinking about uh, as our learning moves forward. And slide will not move forward for me. There we go. My Twitter, dfisherSDSU, feel free to follow me. People all over the world are sending me great ideas and I'm just sending them back out. So I hope they're useful for you. There's all this talk of the COVID slide, the learning loss, <clears throat> and I'm very concerned with this, this language that's being used, this COVID slide and the learning loss is placing students who are already vulnerable and marginalized at even greater risk. This gets in their minds and they think, you know, I worked hard last year and now the world is telling me I didn't learn anything. 
and that's demoralizing. That's frustrating. And it reduces our agency. It reduces our belief that our efforts make a difference and starts to compromise our beliefs in ourselves. The same is true as teachers. <clears throat> this COVID slide conversation, this learning loss conversation makes me think about how hard I worked last year and then they're telling me not, nobody learned anything. <clears throat> I do not agree that we had a gap year. I see no evidence that there was a gap year. Student ninth graders didn't start reading like fourth graders. Uh, we didn't see, uh, they all forgot how to multiply. We don't see that finding. Instead, <clears throat> we need to be talking about, rem in, there we go, we don't have a gap here. We need to be talking about acceleration, not remediation. Remediation slows things down, isolates certain skills. Instead of remediation, we need to talk about how we can accelerate the learning with our students. That's the healthier way to think about, yes, there is unfinished learning. I recognize there is unfinished learning. I'm not in denial about that. Maybe this year there are students who had more unfinished learning than they would have in a more traditional year, but it's not like they lost all their learning and are now regressing multiple years. It's just, that's not the case. Our students have accomplished some learning this year. They've done some great things with learning. There is unfinished learning. And I think our, as educators, we need to figure out what the unfinished learning is and figure out plans to accelerate that learning. But in addition, I wish we would talk a little bit about the unexpected learning that our students did. What was the surprise that they had in terms of their learning? So I've been asking students about their unexpected learning. I've been asking students to tell me what was their surprise of their learning this past year. I'm going to show you a video clip with a few of students that I've captured talking about their unexpected learning. One thing that I learned apart from the math curriculum was how to use a MacBook. The school provided a MacBook for us and I've never used a MacBook before in my life. So it was kind of confusing trying to figure out what, what each button meant, how to take screenshots, how videos and how imported stuff worked. It was hard at first, but then I got used to it. So that was pretty cool. Um, something that I have learned that is not part of the official curriculum was um, learning to make it to make a, um, a cake and um, a breakfast sandwich. What I, did, what I didn't expect this year was to be more clean. I have chores like walking the dog, cleaning up my room, making my bed, little things like that. This year I learned how to clean the hoop that you can build strong relationships when you participate, work hard, talk about food, and try to learn at least one thing about a classmate. And I wasn't expecting to learn how to make a Google Plus and make a Google Link so I can make with my friends that I miss a lot from my other school. My name is Angel and I, didn't ex I did expect to learn reading, math, and writing. But I didn't expect to learn, to learn more than just reading and writing. But we learned to take care of each other and be kind to each other. Pretty much what I've learned besides just math. Like, what have I learned in his class? And for me, the biggest thing that I've learned is communication and being able to conversate within my peers. Because... I really, I've never really found like a kind of need to want to actually talk with my peers or get along with them. <laughs> like that's just not, that's not something that was always really important. So with Mr. Mansour actually pushing us to like want to work in groups together or making us do group comps or even just doing like the question of the day, that just helps with building trust and relationships, which I think is amazing. Like it's. I wasn't such a big fan of it until now. This year I learned how to do ballet moves. Hello, my 
name is Jasmine, and this year I didn't expect to get so good at technology. For example, this year I learned how to take a screenshot of my computer screen. I can even paste my snapshot on Google Classroom to show my work. All right. <clears throat> so our students learn things. I was driving around Los Angeles and I was just passing a school and I saw this sign and I so appreciated this school saying to the community, we celebrate unexpected learning. We value all the unexpected learning. Did you learn how to crochet, code, hula hoop, swim, TikTok, draw, write a poem, take a screenshot, do laundry, be grateful? And all the students that I've collected those videos on unexpected learning, I heard a lot of technology. They learned a lot about technology, but I heard even more about social and emotional development. And we should take a minute and just recognize that our students learned a lot, social emotional skills in the past year. But I wanna focus on acceleration and how we move that conversation away from learning loss into the acceleration. Now the acceleration research is strong. It's got a good effect on learning. It's an above average influence on learning. It's worthwhile. To be, to be clear on this, the vast majority of evidence on unexpected learning, on acceleration, focuses on students who are identified as gifted and talented. And Nancy and I downloaded all the articles that make up this effect size and we read through them. And there are five major things that we need to do to think about accelerating the learning of our students. And the first is that we identify the skills and concepts students have yet to learn. We think through what is it that is the unfinished learning, because that's what we focus on. Why? Because we need to know the difference between what students need to know and what would be neat for them to know. There's a difference here. Not everything from last year and the year before and the year before is critical or essential, but some things are really important. In addition, when we get good assessment information, we can de decrease the percentage of minutes that are spent on things students already know. On average, we spend 40% of our instructional minutes on things students already learn. Imagine if we could reduce that and spend more time on new learning. We could actually move to acceleration. Simple tools can help us figure out what students already know that we don't have to teach. Here's an A to Z chart, very simple A to Z chart. Teacher says, go to your Google slides, grab the A to Z chart, tell me everything you know about volcanoes. And here's one student. Now, if everybody has magma, why are we teaching magma? If they all have crater. Why are we watching the 13 minute video on crater? And we can use these tools to have students track their progress and have conversations with them. What is pillow lava? Is it like regular lava? What's an extrusion or an intrusion? What's a rim of fire? but they're keeping track of their own learning in real time. If we can use these tools, if we can get these tools going and say, here's how I know what my students have learned. Here's what they still need to learn. How powerful is that? Here's a second grade example from Australia. This teacher has her students self-assess. So can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? Of course, the teacher would need to, to verify. But this student says, I don't use paragraphs. I need to know this. That's clearly a something to learn next. There's no reason to spend time uh, with uh, commas in a list because the student already knows that. And this student needs to know more about paragraphs. That's what we want to focus on. The second area in the acceleration research is really about how we build key aspects of knowledge in advance of instruction. How do we provide essentially some aspects of a flipped learning environment? and say, here's background knowledge, here's vocabulary knowledge, here's stuff you need to know before we have the live lesson. And there's all kinds of ways of doing this. And all of us, so we learned so much about videos. What if we could provide short videos to build students' background knowledge and their confidence and their vocabulary knowledge so that when they come to class for live instruction, they have background knowledge that allows us to accelerate and go faster. So let's take a look at a group of teachers doing exactly that. Okay, everybody. Hello, and 
welcome to our lab. Um, Mrs. Doble is here to assist us today with an experiment on inertia. So like you learned in the video that you just watched, inertia is Newton's first law of motion. Inertia says that an object in motion will remain in motion until acted on by another force, and an object that is in place will remain in place unless acted on by another force. So we've set up a little experiment here. So we've got two cups of water, a plate, some paper towel rolls, and two eggs. Now I am going to smack the plate out of the way, and the idea is that these eggs will remain in motion because of inertia, and they will drop straight into the cups below them. Now I've made sure that the eggs are lined up right above the cups so that they should, with Newton's first law, drop straight into the cups. And here we go. How exciting is that? To think about, I'm gonna engage. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch that minute and a half. I'm gonna watch that happen. Wow, how cool is that? And I am ready for my class. I feel confident. I feel energized. I feel ready. What an amazing feeling that would be. And now that we know how to make all these videos, we can do that. And they don't have to be limited to videos, but think about all the ways we could provide students with knowledge in advance of instruction. The third area is to increase the relevance of students learning, increasing that relevance that students see in what they are learning. And what we know about relevance is that, is that relevance is associated with higher levels of self-regulation. And that's an SEL skill that we've been trying to teach for a really long time. And students are more likely to self-regulate, to choose to pay attention, to focus, to redirect their, their energy, to, to engage in all that self-regulation when they see the learning as highly relevant. And we started talking about these clarity questions and every day making sure students have the answers to these questions. What is it I'm learning today? Why am I learning this? And how will I know that I've learned? What if we had lessons that were driven by these three questions that every single day <clears throat> students knew what they were learning? Because when you know what you're learning, you're three times more likely to actually learn it. <clears throat> Why am I learning this? Relevance. When students see relevance in their learning, they are 14 times more likely to engage in the task we give them. And how do I know I learned it? What does success look like? The effect size of success criteria is 0.88, double the average effect of everything we do in school. The average is 4.40 and it's 0.88 for a success. Knowing what success looks like, having something to aim for. And that allows students to have goals, monitor goals. Again, another SEL skill that we're trying to accomplish with our learners. So each day, somewhere in the lesson, students should know the answers to these three questions. I did not say at the outset of the lesson, if you're doing more of a inquiry or discovery, we don't have to tell students what they're learning at the outset. But somewhere in that lesson, students should know, here's what I'm learning today. Here's why I'm learning this. Here's how I know that I will learn it. So we're gonna watch Pablo, a student who's recorded his responses to these three questions. This became common in the pandemic teaching is to have students record back the answers to these, these three questions, kind of like an exit slip for the teacher. Do I see relevance? Do I see connections to my learning? Uh, one thing I learned is uh, about sensory details. And uh, I feel like they're useful because uh, when you can identify sensory details, you know how to, like, you can uh, get more involved in the reading and it gives it more, like, it, it, it's like a more in-depth meaning into the reading. And, uh, I, I've, I know I'm learning because I can now, every time I read a story or watch a movie, I can identify sensory details very easily, 
like let's say if someone says it smells like something i know it's a sensory detail or like if uh let's say a subtitle says uh like strange noises i know what they are and why they're there like to make it more suspenseful and stuff uh and yeah that's that's why i know that i'm learning And I hope you would be proud if your students did that. If your students said, here's what I'm learning today, here's why I'm learning it, and here's how I will know that I learned it. And I hope you saw confidence in this student and, his, and the ability to say, here's the things that I'm learning. And I, I, when I watch a TV and I'm watching the captions, I know what's happening because of sensory details. So my teacher's been teaching me about that. That's what we want to be accomplishing with our learners. That's the kind of experiences we want them to have that build their confidence and their ability to regulate their own learning. The next area is around fast paced, active lessons. And there is some concern about these that, that there's a little worry that we go too fast, but the opposite is remediation. When we slow down the lessons, when we focus on the isolated skills, students often find those lessons boring, so we, the re acceleration research talks about active and fast-paced learning experience, how to keep it moving quickly. And it, it, that's where we want to go with this. We want to make sure we're not, we're not going so fast that we violate wait time, for example. But the lesson moves at a clip that focuses on your learning. It's fast-paced. It's engaging. So now we'll go to uh, Dallas, Texas, and we'll meet Amanda, and we'll watch her and her first graders. And I know all of you don't teach first grade. But I'm hoping you'll take notes of all the moves that Amanda makes to get her first graders learning. We need to know our big goal. If we're playing basketball and we have no idea where the hoop is, are we going to be able to score a goal? No. No, we've got to figure out where that goal is and we have to know what our, what our goal is and how we get there. Our learning goal today is I am learning how to solve addition problems using strategies. That is our big goal. Our success criteria, how we're going to get there, I can use objects or pictures to show the problem. I can find the sum of a group of 10 and another number. Ready to rock? Ready to rock, start, to I am learning. I'm learning. How to solve. How to solve. Addition problems. Addition problems. Using. Using strategies. strategies. I, can I can use objects and pictures, use objects and pictures. To, show to show the problem. I can, I can find, find, find the sum, the sum of, a of a group of 10 and another number. And another number. Ready to rock? Ready to rock. Once we know what our goal is, then we are ready to work toward that goal. But first we have to know what is that goal that we're looking for. Our goal today is to solve addition problems using strategies. We want to use different strategies to solve these addition problems. How we're going to do it? We're going to show the problem. We're going to show the problem using objects or using pictures. Once we show that problem, we're going to find the sum. What does sum mean? Kaden? Answer of an addition problem. It's the answer to an addition problem. All right, rock stars, let's take a look at one of our word problems today, and let's see if we can use our success criteria to meet our learning goal. Caden has 20 green toy cars and five blue toy cars. How many toy cars does Caden have? What two numbers are we going to be adding together here? Isabella? 20 plus 5. Now my first step of my success criteria is I can use objects or pictures to show the problem. So we know that we have 20 plus 5. We need to choose objects or pictures to show the problem. When I say go, level 0, show the problem using objects or pictures. Ready? Go.
Did you see, Amanda, clear success criteria, clear learning intentions, uh, routines and procedures in her class, getting her students actively engaged, moving through that lesson very quickly, uh, and, hope, and holding on to that learning with her students. Uh, and they are learning a lot, routines and procedures and, and confidence, and they're responding. It's amazing to watch what, um, what when it, the routines are in place and students know what they're learning and they understand what success looks like. They allocate resources, they engage, they cognitively regula regulate. The cool thing Amanda does is at the end of the lesson, when it gets to level three problems, she has she gives students a problem on their laptop and they audio video record themselves solving the problem and going back to the success criteria very very cool the last area of the acceleration research talks about confidence and that sometimes students who are gifted and talented compare themselves to others and it reduces their confidence and so we were talking about that in terms of acceleration is that probably this is applying to a lot of students they they don't have the confidence needed to really persevere and to, to trust themselves and to engage. So we did a quick lit review on confidence and there are a few things that we know about confidence. That, um, let's go back one, there we go. So <clears throat> we did a quick lit review. Setting goals together, super helpful. And I hope you saw Amanda set goals with her students. Encouraging self and peer assessment builds confidence. And I hope you heard me talk about Amanda's students self-assess against the success criteria as the problems go up in level. Useful feedback. I hope you saw Amanda give her students useful feedback. Those three are probably generally known, commonly known, maybe not always done, but generally known. The next two I think are even more interesting. Empty their heads. Students tend to lose confidence if they think they're struggling more than they actually are. So sometimes we have to meet with them, unpack what's going on, and show them how much they've accomplished. Show that effort is normal. It destroys our confidence when we think we are the only one who doesn't understand something. So let's show students that people have worked through, that everyone's making an effort. And lastly, that we celebrate success for everybody. No matter, no matter how big or small, we celebrate success. And my last video for the day is about rebuilding confidence and agency with students. So the context of this video is, I asked the teacher, this is one of the students about uh, unexpected learning, and this student said, my teacher taught me to read. And the teacher said, oh, she's externalized everything and she doesn't see all the things she did. So let's watch. Good morning, Esmeralda. Thank you for um, hanging out with me during break. I just wanted to talk to you about something that was on my mind. Last week, if you remember, we talked about unexpected learnings and you talked a lot about um, things that you learned that you didn't expect to learn, which was kind of cool. You talked about new technology, like learning how to copy and paste. And you also talked about um, that you didn't expect to learn how to read this year. And you said that I, that I taught you how to read. And you know that made me feel all nice and warm and fuzzy, but over the weekend, it was really, stuck in my mind that I might have taught you some skills and strategies, but you're the one who did all of the work. So when it came to us setting goals together, you met all of your goals. You started off with your, all your letter sounds, your short vowel sounds, blending those together, um, learning how to retell a story, and then you got harder goals um, like digraphs. Um, and going back into the text to find answers to questions all the way to the goals that you're at now, which is your long vowel patterns and using information that you already know to help you learn a new topic. All of these goals you were able to master and it wasn't um, me who did the work, it was you. So I want you to think about how were you able to make your goals? So can you think of something that you did that helped you reach your goals? What helped me reach my goal was I wanted to make my parents proud, so I kept trying and I didn't give up. Absolutely, Esmeralda. You had lots of perseverance. You definitely did not give up. And over the weekend, I really thought a lot about all the different things that you did to make your goals. So I have some more for you that I want to talk to you about. 
So one of the things that I thought of was that, you know, you came to all of your small group meetings. You didn't miss any. So that was really awesome because how can you practice and learn if you're not in the group and you always showed up? Another thing that I know that you did is there's so many times where they were after school tutoring hours and you came for extra help or if you had any questions. Also, Esmeralda, in the small group time, you were constantly participating. You were volunteering to read, you were sounding out the words, you were rereading the sentence if it didn't sound smooth or if it didn't make sense. And so you were fully participating in your small group lessons. Also, you completed all of your assigned work, like everything, you turn in everything. And every article I gave you, every story that I gave you, you read. And so that was all you. You were reaching your goals because you were doing that work. Also, you know, sometimes we talk about how we're learning something, but our brain wanders off for a little bit and we have to refocus our brain. And we've practiced that and you're really great at that. Another one of my favorites, Esmeralda, is you make mistakes. And isn't that the most awesome thing? When we make mistakes, we always learn something new. So that's another thing that you did to become successful. And then, you know, one of my favorite things always is that you ask questions. Anytime you didn't understand something, you asked me to explain it again to you. So all of these things, Esmeralda, are things that, that you did that you were in control of reaching all your all of your goals this year. So I wanna thank you so much for saying that it was me, but really it was totally you. What do you think about that? Um, I think that I thought it was, I wasn't doing anything, but you were just like teaching me. And now that you said what I did, now I'm like hearing what I like did, what I learned. Yeah, that's awesome, Esmeralda. And all of these things that you're doing, if you continue to do them, are you going to reach your next goals? Yeah, we'll work together as a team. I'll do my part doing the teaching and then you do all of this stuff, all of the hard work that you've been doing, and then you'll reach your goals. So I'm super proud of you for all your hard work, Esmeralda. Thank you for coming in. And I hope you appreciated all of the efforts that the teacher put forth to help her student grow. I think this is a life-changing conversation for Esmeralda. Wow. I am doing things. My confidence is growing. I am learning. I feel great about myself. My last comment to you all, and we'll have some uh, some look at some new curriculum, new new innovations, is take care of yourselves as well. Yes, be an amazing educator, do great things for our students and our teachers, but remember to take care of yourself. You are also worth the investment in you. Don't burn out, we need you. I'll be back towards the end of our time together, but for now, Amanda, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fisher, for sharing with us about how we need to rebuild our communities at such an important time for our students and educators and sharing and building on all of the unexpected learnings from the past 18 months. And we're hearing in the question box, the educators who are so appreciative of your words and focusing on those unexpected learnings. Now it is my pleasure to introduce two of our amazing Harmony staff who will be sharing about our newly designed toolkits supporting the efforts to rebuild communities some examples of how some school districts are putting these supports in place and what is just on the horizon for Harmony SEL. I am honored to welcome our Harmony team to this conversation. Laurel Phillips is a strategic, strategic accounts advisor for the Eastern region of Harmony SEL at National University. She is a strong community and social service professional with over 25 years of experience in education as a classroom teacher, assistant principal, college advisor, and consultant. In her current role, Lorel develops and supports relationships with national organizations, educational leaders, teachers, and youth development organizations to promote and implement Harmony SEL and inspire teaching and learning. Welcome, Lorel. Thank you. Glad to be here, Amanda. Josh Pauley has a bachelor's degree and a master's of education from the University of Minnesota. 
as well as a certificate of education finance from the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. He started his career as a middle school teacher in Minneapolis Public Schools. Currently is ambassador for Harmony SEL and is a board member for Minneapolis Public Schools and NAMI in Minnesota. Thank you, Josh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Amanda. Now we'd like to start with Aurel. Thank you and good afternoon again, everyone. We are so thrilled to share with you our back to school toolkits, which focus on evidence-based strategies to support you, your students and colleagues in rebuilding communities. We have some QR codes throughout this part of the presentation for easy access to Harmony and Inspire resources, or you can always find our resources on our online portals at harmonysel.org and for Inspire modules and webinars, inspireteaching.org. So in our educator toolkit overview, we have these four critical questions, addressing sense of community, self promoting self-care, strengthening the connection between educators, families, and other community members, and also how can educators and staff gain the competencies and perspectives to support diversity and inclusion in their classrooms and advocate for justice and equity in their communities for students, colleagues, and themselves. We have some examples that we'll showcase from both of our programs to help address those questions. Um, with the primary focus of our Harmony program being building relationships, our Harmony Quick Connection cards can be utilized with students, staff, families, community members in various settings to provide quick and easy ways to develop rapport, open communication, and have some fun with our conversation cards, where there's something to talk about. For example, what is something that you have done that made you feel brave? And haven't we had to be brave over this last 20 plus months? We also have our collaboration cards, which is just an activity, something to do together, as well as our community builders. And this QR code will take you to our online learning portal to access these quick connection cards. Inspire resources that are recommended in the toolkit for supporting parent involvement. This is where you can learn about the research-based strategies for supporting your parent engagement in our 30 or 60 minute modules, strategies for communicating with parents, addressing barriers to parent involvement, talking about the do's and don'ts for communicating with parents, and give some opportunities for self-reflection and taking stock on our own biases and things that we may bring to each day. But effective communication is important so that all feel valued, welcomed, and appreciated. Our Student Support Toolkit Overview focuses on supporting student SEL, their well being, and providing culturally responsive instruction. Similar to the Educator Toolkit, we ask these essential questions. And the following examples will focus on that third question of how can we leverage what students have learned or discovered through the past 20 months. The, the example that's here is coming from our lesson 1.3, Learning from Diversity. And we're talking about, I know a lot about, where students have the opportunity to write or draw what they know about, which can be used to reinforce literacy skills and encourage classroom instruction. Along the same lines, one example from Inspire resources shared in the Student Support Toolkit include the module Be the Spark, Nurturing Student Inspiration. It shares tips on how to recognize students and celebrate their interests into your classroom and school community. We wanna be able to continue to encourage, nurture, and foster students' inspiration and motivation. This allows us to create learning communities and classrooms where students and teachers want to be there, want to learn, and they thrive and succeed confidently, harmoniously inspired together. Back to you, Amanda. Wow, thank you, Laurel, for that great overview of our toolkits. Now that you've seen a snapshot of those toolkits and you've heard Dr. Fisher's words of wisdom, we'd love you to just to take some time to think about what is one way you are working on rebuilding and strengthening your current community that you work in. 
So as you think about that, I am honored to invite Josh to share some of our stellar Harmony partners who have been working on rebuilding their communities and strengthening their relationships at their school sites. Josh? Thanks, Amanda. Um, I'll share a bit about how some of our Harmony partners are rebuilding communities in their schools. And four big takeaways from the schools and districts that I talked to were investing in robust mental health and SEL supports for both adults and students, a focus on strong communication with students and families, a combination of both district level and school level strategies, and implementing systems designed to support the whole child. Next slide. So I'll go through some examples here. Uh, our first one is going to be from Chula Vista Elementary School District. Um, Chula Vista is located about seven and a half miles between the downtowns of San Diego and Tijuana in the South Bay of San Diego. They have 49 schools serving over 30,000 students and they adapted Harmony SEL back in 2017. So some of their district level supports, um, providing monthly SEL newsletters, resources, and virtual classrooms for both teachers and families. They have over 20 optional professional learning sessions for teachers and staff on providing SEL in a virtual setting, um, trauma, grief and loss, anxiety, self-care, healthy relationships, avoiding and recovering from vicarious trauma, among a number of other offerings. They've created partnerships to provide therapists and mental health professionals to support hybrid instruction. Um, this school year, they hired an MTS, MTSS coordinator, which is multi-tiered systems of support, and the MTSS director and the MTSS coordinator provide bi-weekly professional learning for their new site counselors and social workers. They have weekly office hours and quarterly visits. They've also hired additional uh, district social workers to support students experiencing homelessness and those in foster care and partnering with Elizabeth Hospice to provide grief support groups on site. Next slide, we'll look at some school level supports. So all schools have full-time psychologists and at least two and a half days of a school counselor or social worker. Um, there are 10 school sites with exceptional needs. Those are provided with a full-time counselor or social worker. And this is in response to their current needs and is new for this year. Um, previously sites had psychologists, but most were not full-time and they're now all district funded. Um, all school sites were provided with access to daily mindfulness programs starting this year and for the next three school years. All schools continue to provide a minimum of 15 minutes of SEL a day. Um, the goal this year is to be more intentional and cover all five of CASEL's core competencies. And um, I'm happy to report that most students have exceeded this designated 15 minutes. And their first PD of the year was an MTSS with a focus on SEL. And then on the next slide here, um, we're thrilled to show you a video from Chula Vista Elementary School District. And if you're watching the recording, please use the QR code to access the video.
wonderful. We appreciate uh, Chula Vista sharing that video with us. Just wait on the PowerPoint to come back up. The next district that we're going to look at is going to be Oshkosh Area Public Schools. So Oshkosh Area Public Schools, um, which is located next to Lake Winnebago, it's about 50 miles from Green Bay and 155 miles from Chicago. Um, this past school year, they have 23 schools serving around 10,000 students, and Harmony SL was first adopted in 2019. Next slide. So now, um, looking at district level supports. So prior to this school year, um, Osseo, or Oshkosh, sorry, Oshkosh brought in uh, conscious discipline and Harmony SEL for all elementary schools, utilizing an adult first approach with explicit lessons and opportunities to practice. We're looking to increase the social emotional competencies of both adults and students. There have an emphasis on uh, relationship building. And this is started with the superintendent and kind of gone all the way through the organization. Um, the superintendent has emphasized the importance of relationships as well as including this in all their messaging. They're also digging into absenteeism, looking at attendance campaigns, procedures to be more clear and consistent, identifying barriers, and understanding the importance of creating welcoming learning environments. And this year, they're sharing a bi-monthly SEL strategies and tips with the entire district. Um, and then another thing is they're uh, two years into their ICS journey, which is Integrated Comprehensive Strategies for Equity. This work um, with identity, implicit and explicit bias, is about focusing on the needs of all their students and how to be more inclusive. We can go to the next slide. So now looking at school level supports. Um, so schools plan ways to welcome back their students this year. Some schools had upbeat music playing around the school grounds to welcome students and families back. Um, some school staff, they were spread out around the schools to welcome students and families back as they entered the grounds. They made signs to hold, displayed them in the windows and throughout the building with um, really positive welcoming back raises. And prior to the school year, they did some get to know you conferences, which are similar to open houses um, to building those relationships and positive partnerships with both students and families. And an example of you know, an activity they did was at one of their high schools, they sent a postcard to every student prior to the school year starting to welcome them back and set a positive tone for attendance. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about um, Los Angeles Unified School District. LA Unified is the second largest school in the district in the nation. They enroll more than 640,000 students at over a thousand schools and they've adopted Harmony back in 2016. Next slide. So we'll look at some of the district level supports. Um, so one of the main things would be our Harmony Quick Connection cards, using those to build inclusive classroom communities. They've curated resources to support community building at school sites. Um, examples below, the little graphic showing you know, Mindful Mondays and the things that they do at different days of the week. They've also created advisory lessons for middle and high school teachers that focus specifically on community building through circles, stress management, and mental wellness. We can go to the next slide. And finally, um, a school level support would be um, at one of our schools at LAUSD, a principal shared the handle with carry document with his teachers um, in order for them to better support families and students. And this wasn't necessarily created at LAUSD, but it's a great way to increase communication between home and school. So these partners are incredible examples of schools working to rebuild community. It was great to take some time to highlight uh, these amazing partners. And now I will send it back to you, Amanda. Wow, thank you, Josh, for sharing what our partners are doing to really support rebuilding communities and great examples. Thank you, thank you. Now we'd love to take a minute to hear from you. You've heard a lot of examples uh, from Josh, from our partners. You've heard strategies from Dr. Fisher. What is one takeaway for rebuilding your own school communities? We'd love for you to share your answer in the question box. And we will take some time to share out some of the responses. And if you don't have time to share in the question box today, please take the time in our follow-up survey to share your responses because we are here for you and love to hear how these uh, webinars are supporting your practices. So while you are typing in the question box, we are going to pass it back to Laurel who has some very exciting updates about Harmony SCL. Super, super excited to share this brief sneak peek into our Harmony 3rd edition. 
we've retained most of the current program content, but in response to you, client requests and recent revisions in the Castle competency descriptions, we have restructured our unit themes to include the following, being my best self, valuing each other, learning from others, communicating with each other, and supporting our community. Next slide. You'll also be glad to see that many things will stay the same. Our beloved Z, as well as all of the basic structural components of the program in a refreshed but familiar digital platform. There will also be some things that differ. We have a new set of Clubhouse friends, which in introduces a broad range of students with interesting backstories and updated artwork. We've also built upon the amazing work of the original program with the addition of a pre-unit to provide more guidance in the establishment of our everyday practices of meet up and buddy up, personal goal set setting in addition to the classroom harmony goals, and expanded decks of quick connection cards to meet teacher requests for more cards to use. Finally, we know that you'll be pleased to see these new features of the program and have continued access to our current materials. We are working diligently on getting this new addition to you later this fall. We want to continue to support you in empowering your students and staff and supporting your social and emotional development and academic successes. Stay tuned to our website, harmonysel.org, for updates regarding our third edition launch. Back to you, Amanda. Wow, are we excited. Thank you so much for sharing those highlights, Sorrel. We are getting great uh, feedback in the question box and everyone is appreciating that handle with care example. Uh, another uh, audience member says she loved the Esmeralda example. What a great way to share growth. Um, we loved hearing the high level communication and, and uh, flexibility since the pandemic. All of these are great ideas. Working with elementary level children, we are hearing more children asking for time to play, which was something we had not heard in the past. We just, we have given them some time for this and the children are extremely grateful. Others are sharing, they can't wait to use the quick connection cards. Uh, there was a question about the PowerPoint. Yes, you can download it on the handout tab on your go-to webinar panel. Uh, rebuilding student confidence is so important. Social emotional learning directly increases our student outcomes. Great thoughts, thank you so much. I would now like to invite Dr. Fisher to come back and sh help us bring this all together because we've heard so many great ideas. So where do we go from here and how does uh, Harmony 3.0 support this work? Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> There's so many great ideas we've been hearing and sharing and somehow we need to put it all together and, and, and support each other in doing this. And I've been watching this new Harmony 3rd Edition uh, come into being and it's building these healthy relationships between peers and members of the community. There's a deeper focus on community building in this third edition and the units build those social emotional skills <clears throat> and they come together in that how we support our own communities. And they learn about healthy relationships and how to create inclusive environments and pro-social skills and it's just it's all about introducing concepts and getting students to practice. Things like trust and what it means to persevere and what it means to be honest and open and reliable, all of these different aspects that are so important for young people to learn. And they'll learn about the roles in the community, how to repair trust. It's, it's really great to see that the continued development, the ideas from all of the people out there who are using saying, hey, I wish you had a little more on this. I wish you had a little bit more on this. And then watching the Harmony team go in and say, okay, here's how we can do that. Here's how we can add this so that students develop age appropriate strategies, their personal and collective goal setting, how they monitor goals, how they, how they address those goals and then reflect on those goals, how they create senses of community, how they develop trust and the power of the collective and relationships. I think you're going to love the additions to Harmony Third. It's going to be a great next launch for us to support young people in becoming amazing members of our community.
Thank you, Dr. Fisher. We are thrilled that you could be here today and share your expertise and share your valuable remarks for all of us moving forward in rebuilding our communities. I wanna thank Laurel Phillips and Josh Pauly for being here as well today to sharing their words of wisdom and our resources as well. And if you did not have a chance to get your question answered today, please don't hesitate to reach out to Laurel or Josh. We'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today on this important webinar. We also look forward to you joining us later this week for our next national webinar, Cultivating Joyous and Just Educational Space is for All with Juliana Ortebe, the CCSO National Teacher of the Year. You can register on our website today. Once this webinar comes to a close, a survey will launch on your screen. It's very short and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. You can also share some of your takeaways from this webinar that you've shared in the question box as well. We do read your feedback and take your responses seriously. And to this day, your responses have helped us build more successful webinars. We also encourage you to connect with us on social media. Thank you all for joining today. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you at our next webinar.